Good morning. There we go. So uh, we're talking, we're continuing to talk about the kingdom is like, and today the topic is the kingdom is like what the empire is not. We're talking about kingdom versus empire. Those are words we don't use very often. We talk more about liberal democracies and uh, uh, emergent democracies and resistant fighters and stuff like that. When you hear these words, what pops into your mind? Yeah, this is, this is what comes to my mind, Velveteen, you know, the evil emperor and his henchman who does his bidding. Uh, these are, actually, if you're not, some of you kind of geeks are like it in my generation. You might be more familiar with these images. Selfridge, that's the guy, the uh, corporate greed head is Mr. Selfridge, appropriately named, and his general who does his bidding for him. You might think of empire in these ways. And actually, both of those uh, images, the Star Wars stuff and the Avatar things, they're, they're pretty apt, actually, for understanding what empire is like, what kingdom is like. Well, when Jesus came, he started talking, as we've mentioned before, started talking about kingdom. If there's one thing he said over and over and over again, it's this. Hey, I'm here to announce something new. God's rule, God's kingdom is here among you. We're starting it now. And he said that in a way that looked very different than the context in which he lived. There's this quote that's from the 6th century BC in the Roman Empire. You find it inscripted throughout the empire. And it says this, Augustus has been sent to us as Savior. The birthday of the God Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel. That sounds like some, you swap some names and you could perhaps imagine reading that in Scripture, couldn't you? Because the gospels of Jesus use the same kind of language. Jesus has been sent for us as a Savior is given. And it'll be for the whole world, right? His birth proclaims gospel, good news, right? Now, when the gospel writers were employing the same language, they weren't just copying. It's not that they lacked creativity, and they just said, well, you know, well, I guess this is the way you write these things. They were making a point. They were subverting this. This is a direct challenge to empire, Every time Jesus spoke about kingdom, he was directly confronting and challenging the empire at hand. Just like those Star Wars guys and, uh, and Avatar folks. Now, both kingdom and empire offer us two different ways, two competing ways to define our identity and establish our purpose. Let me talk just a bit about how they do that. They define identity and they establish our purpose by doing these things. They, first of all, they keep order. They have ways of keeping order. It's a good thing. We can't have society without order being kept. They also set boundaries, and we have to have boundaries. We couldn't get anything done if there weren't clear boundaries. They manage resources. Oops, got a... And they pay account. How it pays account. Now, these things are all good things. Every community, every society needs these kind of things, but there are two completely different ways of going about keeping order and setting boundaries and managing resources. We're going to take a look at a couple of these things. I'm going to move down here and look up at the screen with you guys. So we got empire there on the left and the kingdom on the right, and they both establish order and they keep order in different ways. Empire does it by using force. Have you any of you been watching the Occupy movements in Wall Street or in Boston or now like a hundred different cities around the globe? Anybody watching that? Anybody paying attention? Wow. This might just be the biggest uh, anti-empire movement in your college career and folks don't seem too attuned to it. Right. Well, there's reasons that we're not too attuned to it. We would be if, if there were a little more force. Did any of you see images of nightclubs and, and police officers arresting folks down in Boston last week? Kind of uncalled for violence. Because when empire's boundaries are irritated, it responds in force and in violence. Right? How does, how does a kingdom work? 
How does it keep order? Use, use your imagination. Pull back from literature. How do kings, good kings, keep order? Through loyalty, right? Think of the citizens of Narnia, right? <laughs> Love of their king, and they're, they're loyal to the king because he sacrifices on their behalf. It's easy. You know, it, here's, here's just a, uh, an immediate example how, how tricky this stuff can be. We all have to keep order, but how do we do it? It's so easy to slip into empire-type ways of trying to keep order. My chapel staff and I had this conversation a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago. It was this. You know, there are folks in the back who just persist in not being fully present when they're in this room. We have lots of opportunities to do lots of different things. We ask them over and over again to put their homework away and turn off their phones and be here now, as Abram says, to bring, or this is a great phrase Abram uses, to bring your whole self into the presence of God. That's the invitation over and over. And we say, if you don't want to come, don't come. But if you do, do come and join us and be with us in this act of worship to God. Right? We want to invite you into that. You know? And it's easy, it's, it's really tempting, <laughs> it's, it's really tempting for a guy like me to, to slip into, you know, Palpatine type modes, you know? Slip over to the dark side. <laughs> Feel the anger, give in to the anger. You know, we talk about using ropes, we say, well, you know, we really don't need all these seats back here. There's so many great ones up there. Let's use ropes and we'll just block this stuff out. And food doesn't belong here. You know that. So just <laughs> so if we just use ropes, you t- it, doesn't, it doesn't belong. So, you know, so we ask to do it. But if you're not going to ask, well, then we'll just use some coercive techniques. Not, not like waterboarding or anything. It's just simple, <laughs> just really simple ropes that kind of bring folks forward. And, you know, but we thought about it and thought, no. Because that sends the wrong message. We do want to keep sending the message to come into worship, an invitation to come and be present in worship. And I want folks to sit wherever they want to sit when they come to worship, right? I sit in the back half of the church every Sunday. I like it back there. So, but it's easy to slide. I, and, and you know, uh, um, for me, on the highway, my 11-year-old son would tell you what I call other drivers who are misbehaving. It's easy to slip into violence and force. Another thing that, that kingdoms and empires do is they set boundaries, and they tell us who's in and who's out. Empire does this in really uh, devastating ways, in really fine and exacting ways. Empire can tell you probably what is the ideal lip size you know, and hip size, and bust, and height, and hair length, and color, and eye shadow, right? Precisely defined. And if you're outside of that, you're outside. You're kept out, you know? As all, Empire has all kind of ways of demanding conformity to look like this. Look like this. Kingdom, on the other hand, has universal love of neighbor, Love all. You love all. You know, uh, I, I had this memory. I'm not sure what brought it back. It was like a bad dream. I was seven years old, and, um, and my friend John Field lived next door, and he had a Monty Python LP, vinyl LP with Monty Python. These Brits telling jokes to each other. And we listened to it, thought it was really, really funny. And in second grade on Fridays, my teacher said, we're going to have a joke moment, like right after lunch. And anyone who wants to tell a joke can tell a joke after lunch, you know. And I stayed awake at night, you know, kind of fantasizing. This is what it's going to be like, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to get a great joke, and I'm going to tell it. It'll be great. And people will think, he's really witty and funny. He'll, he'll definitely be on the in, you know, not on the out. And so I memorized this exchange, this dialogue from the... Album, but there are a couple of problems with this. And one is it's kind of philosophical humor, not the stuff of second grade, <laughs> you know? 
And secondly, it was British humor, which wasn't a hit in any of the elementary room, you know, classrooms. And, but the third thing was this, that uh, John Cleese and Terry Gillum have these beautiful British accents. And in place of that, I had a horrible speech impediment. I could, it was hard for people to understand at all what I was saying. But when it was time to tell a joke, I put my hand up. And I can remember standing at the front of the room, my hands clipped onto that little chalk tray with my back against the blackboard, and I start into my joke. And it wasn't really a joke. It was kind of this, this dialogue between two guys sitting on a park bench talking about their intestines, you know? <laughs> and, and I kind of went through it, and I'm pretty confident that nobody really understood what I was saying or why it should be funny. And I remember the look on my teacher's face, and and said, well, Greg, this was supposed to be a time for jokes, you know? I didn't tell any more. I was out. It's, you know, it's a simple, innocent thing. My second grade teacher was not Palpatine. She wasn't. But we belonged in an environment that defines what the boundaries are. Who's in and who's out. And I was out pretty clearly and stayed out a pretty long time. On the other hand, Jesus says stuff like this. Hey, let the little children come to me. When his disciples are trying to be empire-like, no, keep them away. He says, no, let them come. He says, in fact, if you really want to come, you must be like a child. Come to me. Why? Because there's universal love. The boundaries we set are inclusive. Right? Another thing we do, how we use resources. Empire has this schizophrenic, or not schizophrenic really, bipolar attitude towards resources. On the one hand, it acts as if resources are extremely scarce. And because they're scarce, I gotta get mine now. Right? Worlds are conquered. People are enslaved. Entire races are extinguished. Because empire says, I want that resource. I need it for me. There's not enough to go around, so we're going to be damn sure that I get mine. That's what Empire says. But then, in this kind of bipolar way, on the other hand, it says, hey, there's so much that we can use it up however we want. We can just keep consuming, keep using. In fact, our, the whole economic model that our country and Western civilization is built on is the increased consumption of goods. As if they're limitless. It's neurotic. It is. But empire can't see. It bounces between one and the other. They're so scarce, I'll use violence to grab them. They're so abundant, I will use them squanderously. As opposed to kingdom, which talks about stewardship and abundance. There really is enough for us all, enough of everything we need for all of us. If we steward it wisely and don't hoard it for the few, use it well. Different model. How we pay account. In the empire, the empires have a thing for bureaucracy, excuse me, of making things so complicated that you're not really sure what it is you're doing at any moment, right? You can't really be sure. I read an article uh, earlier this summer about Tom's sneakers. You guys wear Tom's? Yeah, they're pretty cool. They're, I, see, I, there's more, I see more feet with Tom's and hands in the air. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom's, if you buy one pair, they give another pair away. That's a pretty cool thing, right? That's like a socially conscious way of purchasing a pair of fashion sneakers. But, you know, some of the countries they give those away to, some of the communities they're pouring those sneakers into, are putting local artisans out of business. Hmm. Are Tom's a good thing or a bad thing? Are you helping your neighbor? Or are you stealing your neighbor's job? It's hard to know, isn't it? It's quite difficult to know. I have a few dollars in a retirement account. And those monies are invested in all over the place. Some multinational things which have subsidiaries that I'm not sure what it is they're doing. 
It's hard for me to know exactly what my retirement dollars are doing in the world. Even fair trade coffee sometimes, uh, it lures regions into cultivating a high-priced export crop in ruining the land for crops that could be consumed locally in places that need the nutrition. Is it a good thing to buy fair trade coffee? Or does it do more harm than good? These are difficult things, and empire thrives on that. Because here's why. If you can't know the consequences of your action, then you can't really be responsible. How can you be held responsible for what you cannot understand? And if you're not responsible for it, you're really not free. We can go to the grocery store and have 28 different kinds of ketchup to choose from. Looks like freedom, but it's really not. It's really not. Whereas in the kingdom, we're accountable to our neighbor. Right? Jesus told a lot of stories about neighbors. Loving the ones who come across your path. Ordering your lives so that you're in right relationship to those around you. Man, this is interesting stuff. So in the end, you get uh, the kingdom defines identity as being rooted in relationship. Not in what we accomplish, not in how we look, not in how witty we are or how good we can tell jokes in second grade, but in what our relationship is to the God who made us and knows us. Our relationship with a community of believers who supports us and benefits from our gifts. Our purpose in life, seek God's glory and love of neighbor or the common good as our president likes to talk about. Faithful leadership for the common good. So we love our neighbors. In the empire, identity is based on purchasing power and sex appeal. If you got those two things, you are somebody. If you lack one of those things, you can get by. Somebody in the other camp who misses the other half will kind of pair up with you, and together you'll have it, right? But if you don't have either of these, you're nobody, you're out. And the purpose of life is to protect yourself, to secure your own future. Get ahead. But it leads to incredible insecurity. Incredible insecurity. You you may not know this, uh, but in the corporate world, uh, as in the academic world, there's great anxiety. People who look like they have more than they could ever possibly use in life are anxious that they don't have enough. Some of you who are the best looking are also the most insecure about your appearance. We, just sitting in this room, are well in the top 5% of folks who have walked on this globe in terms of opportunity and comfort and privilege. But we fear that we don't have enough. Fear that it won't work out quite right. Their lives may not be meaningful. We may not succeed in what we need. Empire leads to death. The kingdom brings life. It's like a tree. You take a little thing, like a little seed. It grows and it blossoms and it provides a benefit to those others around it. Empires like a pyramid take thousands and thousands of life and submit them to labor and toil to build a dead structure that celebrates one dead person. Empire leads and points to death. This kingdom brings life. It's so easy. We have to order our lives. We have to set boundaries. We have to manage resources. We have to pay account. But in which way do we do that? It is so easy to slip into empire-type ways. So I ask you this. What are you listening to? Who are you paying attention to? What has your ear and your eye? If you hang out at the mall too much, The mall's not a bad thing. We buy stuff, we buy clothes, even these magazines. Fashion is not an evil thing. Sex is not an evil thing. Appearance, caring about your appearance is not an evil thing. But when the message is you become somebody, if you have it, then it is evil. Rather than you are somebody so you can enjoy it. These magazines take good gifts of fashion, of beauty, sexuality, 
and turn them into oppressive monsters of the empire who will crush you, right? You know, uh, what do we got here? No, we're going to skip over this. Jacques Ulule said this. He was a French philosopher and thinker. He said, Christians ought to be troublemakers. They ought to be creators of uncertainty, agents of a dimension incompatible with society. Ulule is saying this. If we follow Jesus who announced a new kingdom, our way of life ought to be out of sync with the empire in which we live. What would be troublemakers? What would it look like for you guys to be troublemakers? That is, to not live by the rules of empire. To celebrate folks for their character and not their appearance. To believe in folks when they have unrealized potential instead of just celebrating those who have already expressed their possibilities. What would it be like? What would it be like for the sake of the world and our neighbors to live this way? To lead faithfully for the common good and love of our neighbor in these ways. There's a, an author... Um, he's, he's a kind of a senior pastor. If there is a pastor in the U.S. right now, it's probably this man, um, uh, Eugene Peterson. We're going to read something by Peterson in just a moment. Before we get to that, I want to read to you this statement, meditation by an Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann. And he, what he says is just right on, I think. I'm going to read it to you. He wrote this in Christian Century about 10 years ago. He says, if you're like me, while you read the Bible, you keep looking over at the screen to see how the market is doing. (laughs) While you're reading scripture, the God says, all is sufficient in me. You'll have what you need. You keep an eye on how your investments are doing, how the market is doing. And if you're like me, you read the Bible on a good day, but you watch Nike ads every day. And the Nike story says that our beginnings are in our achievements. Our beginnings are in our achievements. And that we must create ourselves. My wife and I have some young friends who have a four-year-old son. And recently, the mother told us that she was about to make a crucial decision. She had to get her son into the right kindergarten. Because if she didn't, he wouldn't get into the right prep school. And if he didn't do that, it would mean that he wouldn't be able to get into Davison College. And if he didn't go to school there, then he wouldn't be connected to the bankers in Charlotte. And he wouldn't be able to get the kind of job where he'd make a lot of money. Right? Conformity. A prescribed path. The appearance of freedom, but not. And he goes on, he says, our friend's story is a kind of parable of our notion that we must position ourselves because we must achieve. We must build our own lives. And according to the Nike story, whoever has the most shoes when he dies wins. The Nike story says that there are no gifts to be given because there is no giver. We end up only with whatever we manage to get for ourselves. And the story ends in despair. It gives us a present tense of anxiety, fear, greed, and brutality. It produces child and wife abuse, indifference to the poor, the buildup of armaments, divisions between people, environmental racism, It tells us not to care about anyone but ourselves. And it is, he says, the prevailing creed of American society. Wow, quite an indictment. How prevalent it is, I don't know. Is that the only story in the U.S.? No way. There are great places like this, lots of them, trying to sing a different song, tell a different story, invite folks into a different way of being, following Jesus into this different way of living, not in scarcity, but in abundance. Not in squandering, but in careful stewardship. Not that we make up our identity or try to achieve it or try to find it by how we look or what we can do, but rather finding our identity as beloved and gifted children of God in a community people of people who benefit by what we can bring. Our identity we take to our work rather than deriving it from our work. You take, your beauty comes out from who you are, not from what you can possibly put on. 
Right. I'd like to invite you uh, in these last uh, couple minutes that remain, we're, I'm going to invite you to stand and, and recite together. We're going to read together what might be seen as the kingdom manifesto. Would you stand up? We're going to, we'll find, you can find this, it's probably pretty familiar to you. It comes from Matthew t- chapter 5. And if there is a manifesto to the kingdom of God, it's probably this. And it stands in remarkable contrast to the empire of Jesus' day. It stands in remarkable contrast to the pressures and patterns of our own day. It is the Beatitudes. We're going to begin by reading uh, the preface together, and we'll close with the preface together. And then we'll do left and right. I'm going to have you guys on my left be the right, right, and you on my right be the left. And we'll split the balcony right in half, left and right. And you'll see that of the eight Beatitudes, uh, I'll have the, I think if we start with the right, or maybe we start with the left, I can't remember. But one of you starts, and we answer each other back and forth as we read these Beatitudes. Now these ones come from the message, which is a, a paraphrase by Eugene Peterson. He looks at the scripture with fresh eyes, a serious student of, of the Greek uh, and the Hebrew before that. Um, but it, maybe these fresh words will help us hear it differently and ask ourselves again, do we want to follow this guy, Jesus, who gave us this manifesto, this way of being in the world, of living in a kingdom that stands in contrast to the empire? Let's start. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were appreciative to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions, and this is what he said. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time you put people down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And you know you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Lord God, I pray that you would lead us into the right kind of trouble. Give us eyes to see the forces around us, the patterns around us. Give us hearts that are grateful for your original blessing of creation and all that we need. Give us courage to walk in new patterns, the ones you taught. And give us the faith to reach out and walk closely with those you've put us in companionship with here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.